Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. And by Wyndham Garden Lafayette. From Café Vermilionville in Lafayette, we're out to lunch with creative business consultant Aileen Bennett. It's business, Acadiana style. Hi, I'm Aileen Bennett. Welcome to Out to Lunch. For hundreds of years, philosophers puzzled over the mind-body connection, the relationship between our physical body and the feelings, emotions, and mental abilities that define us as human beings. Eventually, philosopher René Descartes summed up the mind-body connection is, I think therefore I am, which seemed like the final word on the subject. Then, as we progressed as a society, the mind-body connection conundrum became the province of psychiatrists, psychologists and neuroscientists and even nutritionists. Today, the mind-body investigation trickles down to a corner table at Café Vermilionville in Lafayette, Louisiana. On the body side of the mind-body connection is Brian Molosson. Brian is founder and CEO of a company called C620 Nutrition. In bodybuilding circles, Brian is known as the mad scientist. He's a fitness trainer with a focus on nutrition and a reputation for training successful power lifters. Brian is also expanding his love of nutrition to the wider Lafayette community with his purchase of the health-focused f- bakery Great Harvest of Acadiana. Brian, welcome to Out to Lunch. Hey, thank you so much for having me. On the mind side of the mind-body connection, let me introduce you to James Huval. James is a psychotherapist. He has a practice in Lafayette called South Down Consulting. James was a therapist in New York and New Jersey for 20 years before coming back home to Lafayette in the early 2000s. If you live in Acadiana, you might avail yourself of James' services if you need help in any area of emotional or psychological distress, including anxiety, depression, workaholism, sexual dysfunction, grief, anger, relationship issues, and many as- other aspects of coping with the demands of daily life. James, welcome to our tonight. Hi Eileen. Brian, stores like Vitamin Shop and GNC are filled with supplements. Drug stores like Walgreens and CVS carry shelves of supplements. You introduced your own line of supplements in 2018. To say you're competing in a crowded field is an understatement and the people you're competing against, the makers of nutritional supplements, include the big names and major companies. So, two questions. One, What do your supplements have that are unique to anything else on the market? And two, how do you compete with every other product on those very crowded shelves? So with the expansion of C620 into C620 uh, supplements, uh, my main focus was, well, I have a foundational principle that I just do business by. If if you know better, you're responsible to do better. And um, so much of the supplement industry is strictly profit margin driven, and it's not based on what's actually best for the end consumer. You know, they just did an an audit of a, a lot of major major supplements that are in major stores like Walmart, Walgreens, and they found that uh, major brands were were filled with like rice powder and didn't even have the ingredients they said they had in them. So like the FDA doesn't regulate the supplement industry, so there's a, it, it's just, it's not the most moral business. So you can just make something and say it's got something in it and nobody checks? Correct. Um, like if you wanted you tomorrow, you could contact a manufacturer put a capsule full of rice powder and say like Eileen's focus factor you know and uh, and you could sell it on store shelves and, and how much would I sell that for uh, 39.95 would be a good starting point <laughs> um, so th- there's just not a high uh, moral standard in the supplement industry and uh, so one thing I'm trying to do is redefine excellence in the industry and give the end consumer a product they deserve and so since I do have a science-based background and have years of experience training uh, you know high-level athletes um, I formally my own supplement line to give people the absolute best of what they needed to maximize their progress and so that's where I'm coming from and as far as competing in the industry it's I mean I'm still a super small fish in a really big pond so I'm still learning that part but my belief system is if I put out an excellent product and um, you know consistently uh, it'll grow organically over time so um uh, it, it's a tough industry, but it's like I'm 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 here to stay, you know. But your supplements really have what they say they have in them. Yeah, and so I don't do any proprietary ingredients, so uh, the in the consumer knows exactly what they're getting, and I do third-party testing of my stuff. So if consumers wanted, they could actually look at the reports to see a third-party validating that what's on the ingredient profile is actually what's in the product. 
James, Lafayette has been described as the happiest city in America. And there are two ways of looking at that. One, Lafayette would be the most difficult place in America to have a, s a successful psychotherapy practice because everyone's already so happy. And the other way to look at it is that we must have the best psychological and mental health services in the country because everyone's so happy. As always, I imagine the truth is somewhere in between. As a mental health professional who has worked outside of Louisiana for a good part of your career, is there any mental health advantage to living in Acadiana? And is there really a way we can measure happiness? Well, first I would agree that Lafayette's a pretty happy place. It's uh, a lot more laid back than some other parts of the country I've lived in. Um, I think uh, we're, we're, we're happy, most of us, but we're also dealing with a lot of people are going through transitions or changes in their lives and uh, kind of describe my work as an agent of helping people to transition and change, to go through different shifts in their life that they might be going through. It doesn't mean that they're unhappy, it just means that they might need to have a little bridge to support them through those kinds of changes. And that's concentrating mostly in the areas that I work in. Um, you work with a lot of creative people who have Yes, that. I do. Yeah, um, artists, writers, playwrights, um, actors. Why is it good for them to have someone like you to come to? I think it's a way to bounce ideas off. Uh, it's a way to uh, decompress when things are stressful. Performance work is stressful. Um, I, I think it was Melina Dietrich who said um, acting is uh, standing up on stage naked and turning around very slowly. <laughs> and uh, any kind of um, expressive work is doing that. It's, it's revealing an aspect of yourself that other people don't, don't get to see. And when they see it, you're open to all kinds of criticism and reflection and feedback and things like that. You have to be kind of tough to do it. So Brian, you deal with people going through change as well. Yep. And how much is that is purely physical, eat this, do this, and how much of it is mental? Um, I mean, I tell one thing I put in my starting program for all my clients is uh, this is very much a mental journey um, because, I mean, our bodies are capable of sustaining much more uh, abuse and workload than, than we give it credit for, but it's, it's oftentimes the mind that breaks first, um, especially like when contest prep, you're trying to get to elite levels of body fat. It's, uh, it's not your body that gives out, it's the mind, you know, it's that, that cracking point of like, uh, um, you know, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're lean, it's like, and then, you know, your wife orders a pizza and it's like, you know, but you can't have it for another four weeks and it, it's often that, that, that mental stress that people crack under. So do you often act as a counselor to people? Oh yeah, personal, I mean, personal trainers are pretty much counselors, you know, personal trainers and coaches, uh, but it's, it's awesome because you actually get to have a level of influence in people's lives and, uh, um, but yeah, it's, uh, and just walking, walking through really tough situations with people, they often open up to you about a lot of things. So it's, uh, it just gives you access to things that you wouldn't normally have access to if it wasn't such a close, uh, relationship. I agree. It's, yeah. um, it's going to be mostly about motivation and, um, our brains are wired to very much resist any change in habit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you're working with someone, you're doing this transition process and coaching them through that transition, what we call um, habituation. It's uh, the way the brain's set up. Um, we sit around and we do the same thing and the chemical reactions in the brain stay consistently the same. And what you're asking them to do is do something different. Mm -hmm. And the brain's response to that is, uh, no. Yep. I, 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 I don't want to do that. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of fighting involved in that. A lot of research in this area has been done with uh, people who um, have been through addiction. And my addictionologist colleagues will talk about this extensively, saying that, you know, they, they sort of wait for relapse to happen. It's not if, it's when. Mm -hmm. And what you do with the relapse informs whether a person takes the path to continue growing and changing, mm -hmm. or takes the path of going back to the behavior that yeah. they had before. Yep. Um, and so the pivotal point for me when I'm working with clients, and probably with you, is that moment, that fork in the road, when they look at you or they look at me and they say, you know, um, I just fell down and failed. Um, maybe I should just shut it all down yep. and walk away from it, versus let me reframe the way I think about it and do something different with that and use that experience to inform myself to change. Yeah. 
you know, motivation is great, uh, but there's going to be so many times where you, you're just not going to be motivated. You just have to do it because you said you're going to do it, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that's just the, the, that's where the tough part of coaching comes into play. And I'm sure your job is where it's like, how do you actually convince someone uh, to pursue their own goals when they don't want to, you know? It's in, and when I think of motivation, I think of what happens at the gym in January. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it gets real crowded. And then by February 2nd or 3rd, the resolve is gone and you're mm-hmm. back to an empty gym again. You, yep. can, you can actually work out. So, yeah. yeah. So if motivation's not enough and we're, are we just programmed to fail at everything and have to learn ways to bounce back? Or is there something that replaces motivation? Great point. It's all about resilience. Learning resilience. And how do we learn resilience? Um, I think it's wired into us. We have just um, uh, not kind of, we don't tap into it. Um, uh, uh, Charles Darwin, when he talked about the origin of the species, talked about, um, like, uh, it's not the the biggest animal or the one with the biggest teeth or the uh, most, even the most intelligent one that survives. It's the, it's the animal that adapts to the changes in its environment that is able to do that, whether it's induced by an, you know, by themselves or by circumstance or event, that if we can exercise that or tap into that, we can pull that part of our brain active. We can really, we can really do a lot. You're listening to Out to Lunch. I'm Aileen Bennett. I'm talking with psychotherapist James Huval and Brian Molosson from C620 Nutrition. So let's talk about the business side of what you both do. How do you advertise this to clients? Do you just put up pictures of bodybuilders and hope that other people notice it? And James, how do you advertise for what you do? It's like, feeling terrible? Come and see me. <laughs> what, how, how do you get to uh, those people? How do they know you're there? Yeah, I, 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 I have seen some billboards in town with colleagues marketing that way. I, I was surprised. Um, but, uh, no, it's mostly word of mouth. Um, you, you, you start off, you know, uh, I'm sure training's the same way. It's, it's go to this guy because he's, yeah. he's, he's done this for me. Um, and then in my area, it's also with working with professional colleagues who will refer to you because of your speciality. For example, I don't work with kids. I'm not trained in that. That's a specialty. So I have colleagues I can refer to in the community that specialize in that. So I send those clients. And the truth is you're not just working with people that are like anxious and have breakdowns. You're working with people to keep their minds healthy the way that Brian is working with people to keep their bodies healthy. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, you know, I was just super fortunate with uh, with C620 where I didn't have to advertise much, you know. It, uh, I just posted pictures of client transformations, and it grew super organically, you know, so. And I see that on your Facebook page. You always get those women going, hey, can, can you just yeah. work with me to lose weight? <laughs> yeah. So is that your next line of supplements? Um, well, I, uh, you know, back to the whole, like, you're responsible for what you know thing. It's like uh, supplements are meant to be supplemental, uh, meaning they're the, they're the top. They're There's the, a clue in the name. Yeah, they're, they're the top of the pyramid. You know, your foundation has to be good nutrition, training, cardio, rest, you know. And so I don't ever want to shift uh, my focus to, hey, buy my supplements as opposed to, hey, let's change your lifestyle, you know. But I'm sure you get that inbox with how can I, what's the quickest oh, way for me to. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we live in a microwave society. It's like everyone mm-hmm. wants everything now. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, I do believe like we're living in one of the most creative times in history, but like we have the worst work ethic of all time. So it's like if our creative creativity could coupled with our grandparents work ethic, it's like we could change the world in our lifetime. So let's talk about your two seemingly opposing businesses. Mm -hmm. You have this nutrition company and you help people to shred for competitions. Mm -hmm. And then you have Great Harvest Bread, which (laughs) feeds people lots of carbs. Are you just providing your own clients? Uh, (laughs) That is an excellent point. And uh, if if things get rough, I'm going to try that route. But uh, Uh, Eat this bread. Oh, no, now we have to shred. Eat the bread. Yep, yep. Six months bulking, six months cutting, you know, just back and (laughs) forth. Um, But no, uh, that's a great question. Um, I was actually saving up and in the process of uh, building my own training center, um, um, you know, a C620 training center here in town, because that's been a dream of mine for, you know, the past decade. But uh, um, 
long story short, um, I just really felt the Lord called me to buying a business that I could, actually, could actually meet a need in the community. And so literally even, giving them their daily bread. Yeah. Um, and so because and, it's like um, I don't believe it's the government's job to take care of the disenfranchised, you know, like the like homelessness and poverty. It's a situation where where. Um, these people go through a hard time and we disenfranchise them, but we expect, expect them to repair the relationship with society. And so, um, you know, it's like, you know, the Bible is clear about how to treat the poor, the widows, the orphans, and the oppressed. You know, it's our job. It's not the government's. And so I believe as a business owner in the city, I play a role in the restoration of this. So um, I felt the Lord call me to buy the business. And so I said, okay. Um, and so it's been uh, super interesting and really tough and challenging because it's so new to me. Um, but I, I'm just trying to be obedient and make a difference in the community by actually meeting a need and, and helping people. So what have you learned in running Great Harvest Bread that you also use in your other company? Um, well, it's interesting because with C620, it's like I'm pretty much selling intellectual property, so very little overhead. <laughs> but with Great Harvest, you know, I have employees and taxes and inventory and all this craziness. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, so I feel like I'm learning real business, you know. Have you ever thought of just putting the supplements in the bread and we can make a sandwich? <laughs> There's a thought. <laughs> I have, but uh, I would like my customers to return back. So uh, probably, <laughs> probably wouldn't be the best idea to put my sleep formula in a loaf of cinnamon bread, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's, it's great. So I know it's totally opposite businesses, but like I said, it's just, uh, I felt like it was what I was supposed to do, uh, in being a business owner in the city, which is to, to help take care of the less fortunate. So um, we get to the part where I get to be a psychologist. All right. Brian and James, this is part of the show we call The Interview. Whether you've been on a job interview lately or you've been on the other side of the desk and had to hire people, there's been an interesting trend in job interviews. And it consists of asking job applicants questions that test their ability to think through a problem. I have a list of 20 of these interview questions in front of me. I'm going to ask you each to pick a number between 1 and 20. Awesome. And I'll ask you a random question and just let's see what happens. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. 17. 17. What was the last gift you gave somebody? Oh, my goodness. Is it bad that I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got the job. <laughs> oh, yep. Oh, my gosh. I have no idea what was the last gift I gave someone. Um, a book. I gift out a lot of books. Um, like books that have changed my life, I buy extra copies of and... And give out to people when I feel, when I you know I see they're going through a certain situation. So. So what was I, the last book that you can remember? Uh, the last book I gave out was to a person uh, at my church named Teresa. It was a book called uh, uh, Poverty, Riches, and Wealth by Chris Valentin, and another book called Dream Wild by Jennifer Leclaire. And so, what does that tell me about you? Um, that I am super handsome and awesome and, <laughs> <laughs> and generous and well read and uh, but yeah that, so that was the last gift I gave was uh, books no, see yep. if, I, if I was interviewing you I would make notes on that <laughs> James pick a number uh, seven seven how many people flew out of Chicago last year oh my god <laughs> fast facts um, probably 500,000, 600,000. And how, how do you know that number? I don't, I'm guessing. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> you actually also travel a lot, don't you? I do, I do. So I, did you, last time you were in Chicago Airport, did you, uh, did you I, count? I, I have to be honest with you, I try to avoid O'Hare Airport. <laughs> that's a seasoned traveler, they all, they yeah, all try to yeah, do there's that. There's certain ones I pick and that's not one of them. Um, I have no idea. I get, Half a million, I guess. It's a huge airport. It's one of the biggest in the country. I think the yeah. idea with these questions is not so much that you know the answer. It's to see how you are yeah. when you don't know the answer or yeah. see how you logically work yeah. it out. It's a guess. Is it the <laughs> second biggest airport in the country? Yes, that's uh, Atlanta's Atlanta. Atlanta? Yes. Yeah. Atlanta's the largest. Yeah. yeah, all I know is I avoid it. That would be my answer, yeah, too. Yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. But you, you do travel a lot. I envy you. You're often in Japan and places like mm -hmm. that. Does that help what you do for a living? Uh, it helps in two ways. It expands my uh, respect and understanding for cultures and um, 
tolerance levels so that I'm open-minded and accepting of people where they're coming from, which is our first priority in, in working with clients, is to accept them where they are. And then the second thing it does is it, um, it gives me a break. And we all need that. We need healthy breaks between our work to be able to kind of do it and do it well. Is that so, something you have to persuade creative people to do sometimes? Because sometimes, they want yes. Yeah, and it's part of the prescription I work with in clients is, is I tell couples, uh, if I have a couple coming to me, I will say to them, you know, four times a year, you guys need to drop the kids off at grandma and go overnight anywhere. I mean, you can go to Baton Rouge if you want, or you can go to go to New York if you like, but to do something that allows you to step out of the situation you're in and um, kind of have some time away to detach from things. And it's healthy detachment, not the negative kind that people do with when they walk away from situations and don't um, deal with their face reality. So Brian, you talked about work ethic earlier and you said that you thought that we have the worst work ethic at the mm -hmm. moment and you wish we'd had off. Do you not also find that people have that, I must work all the time and I want to get this done? Is that something you find or is it just you don't? Um, I think sometimes that um, um, busyness can mask as, uh, well, well, this, this is going to sound harsh, but I'll explain it. But it's like, I think sometimes busyness can masquerade as like artificial significance. Um, meaning like we're, we're in this mindset of uh, uh, the more we do, the more important we are. We're in, in, in reality, it's, it's not, you know. And like, don't get me wrong, I mean, there's still phenomenal work ethic with people, but like we're a busy generation. Do you think social media has caused or helped that? I'm going to ask you about social mm -hmm. media as well, James. I think social media has uh, some great benefits, but I also think it's, um, I think we're worse off for it, honestly. I, it, I agree. I believe it connects us more, but uh, I mean, we live in a generation where everywhere you look, people are staring down at their lap, you know, on their phone. And it's like, it's, it, it's, it, it, we're becoming a generation that's actually less connected. I think our brains are having a little learning curve with this generation and the next few in terms of how to adapt the technology and the speed with which information is delivered to mm -hmm. us in regards to how we digest it yeah. emotionally, physically everything. Do you think it causes more pressure on people, James, that we should be like this or it feels like everyone else's lives are perfect I, and mine uh, isn't? Yeah. yeah, I think it ups the ante and there's a lot of comparing going on out there that can be very negative. And, um, what I, do you say to people that come with you and you realize that they're getting this pressure from social media? Cut that out. <laughs> So just don't look at it, or...? Um, well, I mean, it's not as simple as that, but just um, to be able to kind of, like, create a transition. I had a client a few weeks back, and I said, let's get off Facebook for five days. I promise you, you can go back to it on the, on the sixth day. And the client did it, came back and went, wow. I, I, what I realized was I had all of this time that I didn't have any that, that got robbed from me in terms of my ability to get things done and be more motivated and more focused. We're wired for affection, like we're wired yeah, for intimacy. Yeah. And so the thing with social media is just like people are, are posting their highlight reels for and you know to get likes and for affection, but it's like it's it's our souls that are, are still empty and actually craving significance, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's like as a coach and you know you as a therapist it's like it's like how do we actually um, empower people and uplift them into who they're truly called to be and their mm -hmm. value and their identity and so that that's one thing I try and encompass too because this has to be bigger than just making money you know what I'm saying yeah, I agree um, it's just like you know it's like we are wired for intimacy and affection but it's uh we're getting it from the wrong places you know so Brian you obviously work out a lot you're sitting here they, I know it's radio but you're pretty bulked up do you recommend that for everyone is it a certain type of body type that can get there or can anyone do it is it just a way of showing how disciplined you are or do you feel um, better like that no it's uh honestly it's like uh, an insecurity thing it's like no no one starts working out because they're like I'm super happy with myself you know <laughs> so it's like you know it's uh you know it's you know, the old saying, bigger, stronger, faster, you know, and now it's just a, a, a love thing. But it's like, you know, we all start working out from an insecurity, you know. But as far as like what people should do, it's like um, 
first just make sure you're happy and healthy but then it's like get the body type that you're happy with you know because like you need to love the skin you're in regardless but it's like no i don't think everyone needs to body build and get massive or get shredded it's like get to a place where you're healthy your heart healthy you can pass a stress test and get a good mm -hmm. cardiogram Brian and James, you both have separate areas of specialization, but there's obviously a massive overlap between your two occupations. The funny thing is, although we all know there's a connection between our mental and physical well-being, we almost never discuss this overlap in a professional setting. We go to the gym, but there's no psychologist there. We go to the therapist, but there's no physical trainer there. Typically, it's up to us individually to make our own mind-body connection. So, Brian and James, it's been a rare treat to have you both in the same place at the same time, taking part in the same conversation. Thank you both for taking the time to join me today on Out to Lunch. Yeah, my Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. My guests on Out to Lunch today have been Brian Malosson, founder, owner, and CEO of C620 Nutrition, and owner of Great Harvest of Acadiana, and psychotherapist James Huval from South Down Consulting. You can find out more about Brian and James by following the links on our websites, krvs.org and itsacadiana.com. The producer of our show is Grant Morris. Our technical producer is Eric Morrell. Our researchers are Anne Christian and Ali Coates. If you want to know what we all look like, you can find photos from this show on our website, itsacadiana.com, and on our It's Acadiana Facebook page. These photos were taken by Lucia C. Fontenot. You can find out more about Lucia at lafphoto.com. You can get this show and past shows as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. And you can find all of our podcasts at itsacadiana.com. You can also keep up with us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You'll find those links on our website, itsacadiana.com. Out to Lunch is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsacadiana.com and KRVS 88.7 FM. I'm Aileen Bennett. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to meeting you again next week around the lunch table for more business Acadiana style on Out to Lunch. Out to Lunch Acadiana is recorded live over lunch at Cafe Vermilionville in Lafayette. Cafe Vermilionville is open Monday to Friday for lunch and six nights a week for dinner with a courtyard that sets the scene for fine Louisiana cuisine. The Out to Lunch Acadiana theme music, Encore Monsieur, Nice Guy, is written by Mitchell Foreman and performed by Mitchell Foreman and Andre Michaud. Out to Lunch Acadiana business consultants are Pete Prados from Innovate Acadiana and Destin Ortego from The Opportunity Machine. Major support for Out to Lunch is provided by the law firm of Jones Walker, established in 1937 with over 375 attorneys in offices throughout the U.S., providing a comprehensive range of services to a local, national, and international client base. JonesWalker.com. And by Shorten Associates, legal recruiters in Louisiana and Texas. Support for Out to Lunch Acadiana comes from the Wyndham Garden Lafayette, located off Pinhook near Cali's Saloon. Wyndham Garden Lafayette is a pet and family-friendly hotel with reception space for large and intimate events, free parking, free Wi-Fi, and a free shuttle within three miles that includes the airport and downtown restaurants.